Welcome to a half hour of Mind Webs. Short stories from the worlds of speculative fiction. The story this time comes from the book Alternities, edited by David Gerald. It's a tale by Greg Bear, titled Webster. Dry. It lingered in the air, a word of rustlings and whisperings. Vultures fanned her hair, or she ran her finger lean and covered in pink parchment up the page. Dinosaur eggs, Roy Chapman Andrews in the middle of the Gobi. Gray films flickering as the fist-sized ovoids were lifted unborn from their graves. She took the dictionary and folded it, and it gripped her finger in Bible-thin pages with a firm, friendly pressure. Miss Coates did not enjoy life. She didn't enjoy the manifold refractions of the hot sun from city pavements. There was no joy in the bored pain of people in the streets who ignored her. There was no joy in a cosmos where her thin body could give no pleasure, cause no surprises, spur no uncontrollable loves. Miss Coates was fifty, and, my God, the needle in her throat, she had never had a child and never had a man. Loved, once a lonely love, with a boy five years younger than she, and he could have removed this present-day needle from her throat, begged that he be given the chance. But no, she would use her love as bait and let them who wish it pay the toll. I am a pitiful woman, she said, drawing herself full up to five, seven and three quarters from the overstuffed chair. I weep inside, then read the dear Bible and the even dearer dictionary. They tell me my weeping is a sin. Despair of all my fell sins is by far the lowest. She looked around the dry, comfortable room and saw into the gloom of the place where she slept. It wasn't a bedroom because in a bedroom you slept with a man, and she had none. Up the door frame, nicked in one corner down to the worn carpet which pressed the bottoms of her feet like raw canvas, then to the chair coming unstuffed in the middle, to the wallpaper stained with water at the top, and finally to her unshod feet, toes wiggling in their loose nylons, toenails thick and well-trimmed. She went to bed, and the bed caressed her in an obligatory manner with sheets and wrinkles and folds and blankets, small, immobile bumps against her thighs, her breasts. The pillow accepted her peppery hair, which had always been kinky, and in the dark she told herself to go to sleep. The morning was fine. The afternoon passed like a dull ache. In the early evening she wept as she fixed dinner. In the late evening, she sat in her chair with the two books at her feet and stared at the flowers on the wall. The morning was fine. The afternoon was hot and sticky, and she took a walk. All the young people on this fine Saturday afternoon, she thought, they hold arms and walk in parks, and there, there on a bench, she'll be in trouble if she keeps that up. Oh, to have the distant possibility of being in trouble. The evening passed slowly in the heat, and by midnight a cool wind fluttered the curtains of the window, then blew them in like flapping wings on ghost birds. She read the dictionary and stumbled across words she didn't want to read, medical words, biological words. They came at her unbidden from the pages and would not leave her eyes alone. She didn't think them obscene. She thought they were marvelous. The feel of them made her tremble and ache. And again, the evening ended in tears. I need a lover, she said firmly to herself with morning sunlight yellow and reassuring across the ironing board in the burgundy dress. But one found lovers in offices, and she didn't work in trains, and she didn't travel in distant countries, and she seldom went out of town. I need a little common sense to make me stop acting like a child. Miss Coates, her name was not in the dictionary. But there was Coty, Miss Tightcoat, Miss Quatimundi, Coat of Arms, Coat of Mail, and then Miss Co-Author, wife to a handsome author, and they would collaborate, corroborate, celebrate, celebate. She shut the book. 
She drew the curtains on the window and stripped off her dress, slowly running the zipper down the back, feeling the small of her back with fingertips, chin held high. The heat and cool breezes and the dark beyond the window came to fan her skin. Sweat lodged in the narrow cleft between her breasts, which did not sag appreciably when the bra was removed. She lay on the floor, held her arms out briefly against the rough carpet, and looked at her breasts, now flat against the rib cage. A thin crucifixion with legs straight and toes together. Then she cupped her breasts in her hands and with her head near the window looked up to see the curtains flutter like her lungs. Her mouth was open and her tongue rubbed against the back of her teeth. She moved her hands to her stomach and let them lie on the flat warmth and she thought, I am not so undesirable. No flab, few wrinkles, my skin is textured, not wrinkled. My thighs are not heavy or dimpled with gross flesh. No more, she told her hands. She got up on one elbow, one leg over the other, and looked at the dictionary. Lover, she said. I'm not equipped, the dictionary told her in no uncertain terms. The Bible offered no comment, sitting small and tightly noncommittal in its black leather case. Then help me, she said. Dictionary. Dictionary, book of all books, you massive thing. I can hardly lift, you're so heavy. Every thought lies in you. Every human thought can be expressed through what you have inside you. Lives exist in you. People and places I've never seen. Things dead and things unborn. Haven of ghosts and the preternatural. Home of tyrants and saints. Surely you can make a man for me. At least you can tell me how to make a man from you. Make him rise up and spin and dance like a man-shaped birdcage twirled and filled with light. The curtains puffed. Can't you? she asked. The dictionary was silent. She put herself in a lotus next to it and waited for the dust of each word, the microscopic bits of ink, each charged with a name and shape of a letter, a word to sift between the fibers of the paper and meet to hold conference with each other. Dry magic. The words wafted up to her on the evening breeze. Dead bits of ink charged with thoughts arise. Her tongue swelled slightly with the dryness of the ink. She lay flat on her stomach on the carpet to let the magic weave of canvas rough patterns mark her skin and redden her in crisscross lines. She took the dictionary and twisted it around to where it faced her, then flapped it open. Her finger found a word on a page randomly, and she gasped. Man, it said, clear as could be next to her colorless nail. Man. She moved her finger and sucked in her breath. There is a man in you, she told the book. She got up on her elbows and knees and rubbed her finger across the back of her tongue, then scraped her cheek. Here, a few cells from the lining of my cheek. Oh, she was brilliant, she was clever. Clone them. Then she thought better of it and said, But don't make him look like me. Change him with your biological words, plastic surgery and eugenics and genotyping. She spread the saliva across the word man, and the page darkened where the tip of her finger wiped. The ink stayed clear. She shut the book and reposed in her lotus. As my trunk rises from the flower of my legs in the seat of my womb, so man arise from the book of books. Would it thunder? Only silence. The book trembled and the Bible looked somber in its shadow. The yellow lamp sang faintly. The air grew heavy. Don't falter, she told herself. Don't lose faith. Don't... The book, it breathed. It almost lifted its cover. Yes, yes, that was it. It sighed. It took warmth from the air. Frost clung to its brown binding, but with a second breath the frost was gone. The cover flew back, just the wind from the window which shrieked through the room. The pages flapped, but two were stuck together, wouldn't flap. They bulged and then split. Twirling, rising, arms out and spinning like an ice skater, soaking up dust and heat and air, tightening and coalescing. Handsome. Make him handsome and rugged and kind and smart as me, if not smarter. Make him like a father and a son and a lover, especially a lover. 
warm and give him breath that melts my lips and softens my hair like steam from jungles. Concentrate there, yes, large and strong and full. He should like warm, dry days and going to lakes and fishing, but actually reading to me more than fishing. And he should like cold winter days and ice skating. He could, if you will allow me to suggest, he could be brown-haired with a shadow of red and his cheeks rough with a fresh young beard I can watch grow, and he should... He had eyes. They flashed as he spun, beacon still molten and indefinite. His nose became apparent and she approved. His hair danced and glimmered, dark brown with a shadow of red. Arms, fingers, legs crawled with words. A covey of dry ink... Foots clustered at his base. They fought wildly with heels and ankles. Then they were feet. She cried, staring at his groin. His breasts were firm, square, dark-nippled, the hair on his chest dark and silky. She said, Clothes! Ah, oh, yes, I have no clothes for men. A suit, a pink shirt with cufflinks and pearl decorations. His eyes blinked and his mouth opened, then shut and still he was spinning, his head drooped, and a moan flew out like a weight set loose from a flying string. Stop! Stop, please! He's finished! The man stood on the dictionary, sagging, threatening to topple. She came up from the floor to catch him, but he fell away from her and collapsed on the carpet beside the chair. He lay on his side and his chest heaved. The book was sprawled at his feet. The top pages wrinkled and torn. Every page was blank. Miss Coates stood over the man on her floor. Her hands fluttered on her breasts. She went to put on some clothes. In her room, she thought what she would call him. He didn't seem to have any chance for a name, not a Christian name anyway. It seemed perfectly logical to call him by a name like everyone else, even if he was born of a dictionary. Webster! she said. I'll call him Webster. She looked at the man, resting peacefully now, and tried to think of a way to get into a more comfortable place. The small couch would not hold his ungainly body too well. He was very tall, six feet two inches. She measured him with a tape from her sewing kit. His eyes were shut. What color were they? She squatted on her knees over him, face flushed, thinking thoughts she told herself she simply mustn't think. He didn't move as she watched him, though she was in her best dress and perfumed. It was one o'clock in the morning and she was tired. She left him there on the floor, where he seemed comfortable at least, and went into her bedroom to sleep. She fairly shouted with joy and tears came to her eyes to dampen the pillow and moisten her peppered hair. With the first rays of morning, Miss Coates found the hair on her neck prickling, and she awoke with a tiny shriek, twisting around in bed and pulling up her covers. Webster stood in the doorway, smiling. Good morning, Regina, he said. Regina Abigail Coates. Everyone had called her Abby, when there had been friends to call her anything. No one had ever called her Regina. Regina, Webster said. Regina is a name to remind you of queens and Canadian coins and other things. Good morning, she said feebly. How, how do you feel? A ghost of a smile bent his mouth and he nodded his head. Well, as well as could be expected, he stepped into her room and stood by her bed. I'm rather well-dressed, I think, too well-dressed, in fact, it's uncomfortable. He reached out a hand and touched her shoulder lightly. Why did you bring me out? And she stared up at his bright green eyes, like drops of water taken from a five-mile trench in the ocean. His hand lingered around the strap of her nightgown. A finger slipped under it, then tugged it up a quarter of an inch. She felt the pressure of the cloth on her breast. Why? And his breath sifted words and sprinkled them over her across her face and hair. And he asked, And why do I feel so obliged to... He closed the drapes. There was a sound of cloth dropping on a chair. In the darkness, a knee pressured the edge of her bed, and a finger touched her neck. Lips descended to cover hers and part them, and a tongue explored. 
In the early morning hours, Miss Coates gave a tiny, squeezed-in scream. Webster sat in the overstuffed chair and watched her go out the next morning. She shut the door and leaned against the wall, not knowing what to think or feel. Of course, she told herself. Of course, a man made of words wouldn't like the sun. It sounded reassuring, but why? He was certainly a man like any other man. Then again, he was unlike any other man. She walked away from the apartment door and went down the stairs, stepped from the building and faced the world. The new Miss Regina Abigail Coates, debutante. I know, she said. I know what all you other women know, all of you. The sky was rich like a scattering of flowers with clouds and deep metallic blue spaces which drew her vision outward. Breathe, they said. Breathe deeply. You're part of the world now, the real world. Webster still sat in the chair when she returned with the groceries. She fixed lunch and he wouldn't eat. I'm not hungry, he told her, reading the newspaper, and he rubbed his fingers across the pages when he turned them. What was there to say to a man between morning and evening? A man like Webster was infinitely difficult to talk to, not just because he was so erudite, so literate, but because she felt so much for him. He had made her real as much as she had made him dance and twirl and solidify. So they said nothing. He wouldn't eat dinner. He wouldn't drink a glass of wine with her later. She felt at first that this was to be expected in any growing relationship. But at night, when the darkness had again been sundered and her brow was sprinkled with salty drops of warmth, he lay next to her and he moved. He breathed, but he did not sleep. She lay with her back to him, eyes wide, staring at the flowers on the wall and a wide trapezoid of streetlight glare transfixing a small table in its vase. She felt forty, no, thirty, and yet she couldn't give her thoughts to him, didn't dare to turn and talk because the air was full of him. She breathed in a million random thoughts, deep or slight, complex or simple, eloquent, crude. That was why he didn't sleep. He was a generator. A dynamo charged with language. He was busy, even lying still, damp on a hot night and waiting quietly for chance winds to cool him. He moved inside and his breath filled the air with his powers. But she was tired and deliciously filled and she slept. In the morning she stood beside him and wrapped an arm with her fingers, then leaned her cheek to his shoulder. What do you want? she asked. No, he said. No, the question is, what do you want? I'll get breakfast. You must be hungry. No. I'll get some food. Do you want milk? No. I don't want you to get sick. I don't get hungry. I don't get sick. You haven't answered my question. I can't. I, I love you. You don't love me. You need me. Isn't that the same? No, not at all. Would you like to go somewhere today? I can't. I don't get hungry. I don't get sick. I don't go places. Webster, you're, you're being obtuse. Obtuse, acute, equilateral, isosceles, vector, derivative phase, sequential, psych integrative. That's the future of things mathematical for the next 500 years. Do you think about those at night? Did you last night? Words mix in blood. Words are blood. And you, you don't stop thinking when night comes. Words are numbers, too. Signs, importance, measures, and relations, variables, qualifiers. Your flesh. I gave you substance. You gave me a different existence, but no substance. And she laughed, not quite as warmly as she would have wished, and led him back to the chair. She kissed him on the cheek, which was incongruous, considering their state of dress, and she said she'd stay in with him today but that tomorrow she'd have to buy some clothes. Clothes for me, he said with a smile. Oh, and while you're at it, bring back another dictionary. Miss Coates felt the uncertainty of his introverted hours with a dull, sugar-coated ache. She disregarded her fears that, that he was weakening, perhaps fading, that he found her disappointing, and reasoned if she was his mistress, she could make him 
what she wished. At night again, the words poured into her, and she grinned in the dark, lying next to the warmth of the shadow that smelled of herself and printer's ink, wondering if she should have taken precautions. She shopped carefully for him, picking the best clothes she could afford. She bought the dictionary and looked through some gift shops for something more to give him, something witty and interesting for him to do. She settled on a Scrabble game. He was delighted with the dictionary. He glanced at the game dubiously and played it with her a few times. An appetizer, he called it. After two weeks, she said to herself, My God, staring at the hard edge of a table, My God, creating men from dictionaries, making love at my age until the bed is damp, and he smells of ink, not flesh, he doesn't sweat, and he doesn't go outside, and nobody ever sees him but me, me. And who am I to judge that he's really there? What would happen to Webster if I were to take a gun and put a hole in his stomach above the navel? A man with a navel not born of woman is an abomination indeed. If he spoke to her simply and without emotion two more times, she thought, she might try the experiment and see. She bought a gun, a small gun, and hid it in her drawer. She thought better of herself, shuddered in disgust, and removed the bullets flushing them down the toilet. It would be good for a joke sometime, but Jokes like that were deadly, without the bullets even. She carried the gun in her purse when she went shopping so he wouldn't find it. And it made her nervous. She didn't get back until dinner time. She walked quietly through the front door, saw the living room was empty, and heard a noise from the bedroom, a light flop of something stiff on the floor. Webster? Silence. She knocked lightly on the door. You ready to talk? No answer. She swung the door open. Webster was on the floor, legs crossed. In front of him, a dictionary opened almost to the back. Not now, he said, tracing a finger along the rows of words. Her mouth was open, and she let her purse fall from the crook of her arm to her wrist. Readjusting it, she asked, What are you doing? It was the W section that he was looking at. And he said, Oh, I don't know. And reached into his mouth with his index finger and scraped his cheek. He smeared the wetness on the page. No, she said, and why? There were tears in his eyes. He was crying, she thought. The man of dry ink was crying. I'm not even a human being, he said. He crossed his legs fluidly, almost grotesquely into a lotus, and placed his hands at the edge of the book. Why didn't you ever find a human being for yourself? I'm nothing more than a dream. She fingered the revolver. What are you doing? Need, he said quietly. That's all you know. Hunger. Do you know what you have in me? Hmm, not at all. When you find some of the things I am, you're afraid. But you keep me here like, like some commodity. Dear God, first I was master, and now I'm a petulant child grubbing for solutions. What has the world done to you that, that you'd want to create me? You're going to make a woman from that thing, aren't you? She said. Nothing worthwhile has ever happened to me without it going away the moment I need it. Need, he said, raising his hands over the book. You cannot love unless you need, Miss Regina Abigail Coates. You cannot love the real, the here. You must change and make all fine and well the thing you love to please yourself and damn it should it echo what hides within, within you. You, you thing... She breathed, lips curled back. Webster looked at her and at the gun. He laughed. You hardly need that. Hardly need the real to banish the dream. All you need is a little sunlight. 
She put the gun away and smiled through her gritted teeth. Then she pointed her finger and her face went lax. Almost listlessly, she whispered, Bang! The smell of printer's ink became briefly more intense, then faded with the wind. She closed the dictionary with her foot and thought of how lonely it was going to be in the dark with only her own sweat. A loneliness she could not stand now. There was a large bookstore five blocks away, and it would still be open when she arrived. She had her choice now. The story tonight was called Webster, written by Greg Bear. It appears in a book edited by David Gerald called Alternities. This is Michael Hansen speaking. Technical production on Mindwebs by Steve Gordon. Mindwebs is produced at WHA Radio in Madison, a service of University of Wisconsin Extension.